Okay, this is Mike Tully. Hi. Hi, I'm Mike Tully. <laughs>
to make me upwardly class mobile. Um, it, it was a good intention, I suppose, on their part, but it didn't really work out. Uh, however, I went there for four years and uh, did okay academically and graduated in 1966, going, then getting into Stanford University intending to do a degree in electrical engineering. Um, I chose Stanford because they had something called the Freshman Seminar Programs in which their most illustrious senior professors actually had uh, small group seminars with first-year university students. I got to be in a small group seminar with uh, Professor William Shockley, Nobel Prize for the invention of the transistor. I was, I was excited about this. Uh, I was going to get in on the ground floor of uh, electrical engineering in the new field of semiconductor engineering and physics. Um, I did have kind of a good time at Stanford, uh, but unfortunately the freshman seminar didn't work out very well because it turned out that uh, Professor Shockley didn't actually want to teach us anything about solid state physics. I've since seen red writers who questioned whether he even knew anything about solid state physics, uh, particularly some of his graduate students who uh, apparently did most of the work on the invention of the transistor. But uh, Shockley was really much more interested in teaching us his theories of education and racial intelligence. Uh, he was particularly fond of the theory that white people were smarter than black people and you could prove it using U.S. Army intelligence, intelligence tests and Stanford Binet IQ tests. Uh, I was um, brash, self-righteous, and determined to tell him quite loudly that he was wrong. Um, this didn't work out very well and I think I may have been the only freshman at Stanford ever to fail a freshman seminar. <laughs> this discouraged me a bit from electrical engineering um, and I also noticed that all the graduate students in electrical engineering were tall, thin, pasty-faced, pimply young men with their collars buttoned up too tight and large slide rules hanging on their belts and a look of, of constant kind of pallid constipation. They really didn't look like they were having any fun at all. So I got involved in things like campus radio and uh, the anti-draft movement, the anti-war movement, um, music, um, uh, some experimentation with drugs, uh, and uh, discovered having a social life was a whole lot of fun. Okay, next question. The military was pretty important in your family then. Yes, uh, my father had served in the U.S. Army during the Second World War as a, uh, I think he'd made it to the rank of captain. Because he'd been a civil engineer, he'd gotten a commission, gone in as a second lieutenant, and been promoted to captain by the end of the war. My uncle Howard uh, was the Navy man who made it to the rank of commander, I think. My uncle Dave, who was my father's oldest brother, was a career army man and uh, again in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and rose to the rank of major general. And I have a great-grandfather, Day, who was, I think, one of the youngest people to serve in the Union Army in the U.S. Civil War. So the, the family has a long, uh, a long military history. As you mentioned, you were involved in anti-war movements. What attitudes did you and your family members and friends hold towards the Vietnam War? Well, my family mostly held the attitude that you did what the government told you to do. Um, and they may have had their own opinions on whether it was a very... Uh, whether it was a wise idea for the U.S. to get involved in that war or not, but they mostly took the military attitude that you did what you were ordered to do. Uh, some of them, I suppose, might have been enthusiastic supporters of it, and others might have thought it was a stupid war to get involved in, but they weren't actively in opposition to it. And so far as I knew, I was the only member of my family who was, although many of them questioned the draft particularly, and there was a difference between being opposed to the draft and being opposed to the war back then. But I was eventually, after thinking it through some, found that I was opposed to both quite strongly.
So were you drafted? I was eventually drafted, yes. Uh, <clears throat> my, uh, my adventures in university only lasted for about a year before I realized that I wasn't quite sure why I was going to university. I was no longer interested in getting a degree in electrical engineering. I was very involved in the anti-draft movement. One of my heroes was the uh, then president of the Stanford University Student Council, David Harris, and uh, he had gotten himself uh, arrested for refusing to be drafted and uh, gone off to prison. And I planned to do the same thing. So I took a leave of absence from the university to figure out what I was doing with my life and uh, immediately got drafted since I no longer had my student deferment. Um, I had originally planned to refuse to be drafted, but unfortunately at that time my father had been working on a dam building project in Oroville, California, and my parents had settled down there finally in the United States, bought a house, and then the dam building project had ended and he had been laid off and they were having a hard time paying for the house. So he took a job, again as a civil engineer, working for the U.S. Air Force in Da Nang, Vietnam, building airports for the American airplanes again. And I, when I announced my intention to refuse the draft and, if necessary, go to prison, uh, I got a visit from my mother who informed me that if I did that, then my father would lose his security clearance and therefore his job. They would lose the house and my younger brother, Brian, wouldn't get to go to university. It would just bring disaster on the whole family. Very, this very nice put me put me in kind of a quandary, um, so I decided then that I would allow myself to be drafted, but I would look for a non-combatant role, because I really wasn't interested in killing Vietnamese for Uncle Sam. So I um, went ahead with some trepidation and really no idea of what I was doing, got drafted, and uh, applied for non-combatant medic status. Went through basic training, uh, waited for some time while my request got processed all the way up to the Pentagon, came back down again, refused. The U.S. Army felt that I would make a better combat infantryman than medic. Uh, I then wasn't quite sure what to do, so I went ahead with advanced, went on into the advanced infantry training. Uh, this was all at Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, but while I was in inv advanced infantry training, my father finished up the contract in uh, Vietnam and came back to the United States, and his job was no longer conditional on having a security clearance from the U.S. government. So when my advanced infantry training was finished and I got my orders to go to Vietnam, I simply packed up, took my few days leave that we were given uh, in those days before being sent off to the jungles of Vietnam, and went back to Stanford, decided to see how much I could get away with before they arrested me. Uh, there were a lot of young men leaving the U.S. Army in those days, um, and they were not really putting a lot of effort into rounding us up. So I went back to Stanford, uh, re-enrolled, uh, continued, but um, my major seemed to be changing at that point from electrical engineering to philosophy. I was taking courses in psychology, comparative religion, just about anything. I think I still did take some courses that were part of the electrical engineering curriculum, but I was looking for a new path. But I was still involved in uh, student radio, the anti-war movement, and the anti-draft movement. This continued uh, for some time until uh, one of my friends got arrested at an anti-war demonstration and he was being interviewed by an FBI agent who was in charge of keeping track of us, I guess. My friend was in the agent's office and the agent got a phone call and he didn't care to talk on the phone in front of my friend. So he told my friend quite sternly to stay where he was and stepped out of the office to take the phone call. My friend took the opportunity to look through all the papers on the FBI agent's desk and found a list of the people this particular agent was supposed to be keeping track of. 
Most of the names were familiar to him. It included me and all of our mutual friends. They knew where we all lived, what we did, who we hung out with, just about everything about us they needed to know. Um, when he was then released by the FBI agent and uh, came back and told me about this, I realized that if I were actually as effective an anti-war and anti-draft organizer as I fancied myself to be, they would have just pulled me in if I was really doing any good for the cause. They would have handed me back to the army who would have uh, either sent me off to Vietnam or thrown me in uh, a military prison for, uh, for being AWOL or one after the other. So I came to the conclusion that I wasn't really doing much good by staying in California and if I started to do any good they'd simply pick me up. So uh, my friends got together and bought me a plane ticket to Canada. Uh, at that time, my only contact in Canada was uh, uh, a good friend a couple of years older who'd uh, graduated from Stanford and was now up teaching at the University of Alberta and who had let me know that if I ever needed to come up to Canada, I would be welcome to stay at his place. So I uh, entered Canada uh, as a tourist and went to visit my friend Bill in Edmonton. Aside from the fact that you knew that they could get you at any time they wanted, was there anything else that made you want to desert? Well, that was what made me decide to leave the U.S. and come to Canada. My desertion was um, partly on, mostly on moral grounds, that I didn't want to go killing people for the political purposes of the U.S. government. I didn't think it was a war the United States should have been involved in. It had to do with who was going to govern South Vietnam, the, uh, whether the people were to be allowed to have an election or their government was going to be forced on them by the U.S. And I certainly didn't think it would be right for me to go kill people to enforce the U.S. government's foreign policy there. Um, the war itself seemed futile since I thought that sooner or later the Vietnamese would probably get to decide their own fate. Uh, it was certainly killing a lot of Vietnamese and a lot of Americans. I wasn't sure I particularly supported the, the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese or any other faction there, but I just didn't think it was the business of the United States or me personally to go try to tell them what kind of government they should have. Um, that, was, that was my main opposition to the war, that and just a general opposition to wars as not the right solution to any problem. What was it like living as a deserter in Canada? Was it what you expected? Uh, living as a deserter in Canada was much better than living as a deserter in the United States and it didn't take me long to figure that out. I can remember I had been in Edmonton for a few weeks. I arrived here on April 1st, 1970. Um, I came up on the train from Calgary. I had flown to Vancouver and then taken the train from Vancouver to Calgary and then Calgary to Edmonton. And uh, um, was relaxing at a at the house of some new friends one evening and suddenly realized that I could simply go out for a walk and there was there was no risk attached to going for a walk in the neighborhood at 10 o'clock at night. The police would not harass me. Uh, there was not the polarization, the conflict, the racial conflict, uh, the political polarization, or the, the police harassment I would have experienced in the United States. Um, nobody, if anyone cared at all that I was a deserter, they thought that was good. Uh, but mostly they didn't care. And that was fine with me. What was the hardest part of having to come to Canada? The hardest part of coming to Canada uh, being separated from my family. I would have liked to have visited more often, but I wasn't sure about getting across the border. So I didn't cross that U.S. border for many years until I had my Canadian citizenship and at a time when the U.S. wasn't particularly involved in any wars for which they were drafting young men. 
and uh, uh, it seemed a relatively safe time to do it. And even then, I was nervous about going into the United States to visit family. Uh, finally, I did several times, all before the, the disasters of uh, September 11th, 2001. Knowing what you know now, would you have done it again? Knowing what I know now, uh, rather than deserting, I would have uh, refused the draft in the first place, uh, never have allowed myself to be drafted. Uh, I certainly, I think I was quite right in choosing not to go to Vietnam. Uh, I think I was naive about the way the world worked in that I thought I could go to Vietnam by my choice as a non-combatant and try to save at least American lives. Um, the odds are I wouldn't have done very well in that role. Most uh, military medics in Vietnam, uh, well, they themselves suffered a high casualty rate. They were generally expected to carry firearms to defend themselves. Um, I would have been a bit of an odd duck in any case. Would you advise people in a similar position as yourself to do as you have done? I would advise any young men drafted to go fight in foreign wars not to do so. I would really advise any young Americans not to go fight in Iraq, Afghanistan, or any other foreign wars the U.S. should engage in. I don't think those wars settle any problems. I don't think those wars do any good for the United States. Certainly the Vietnam War did no good for the United States. It, the Iraq War has done no good for the United States, and the Afghanistan War is proving to be an even worse disaster, and it has already gone on longer than the Vietnam War. It is chewing up the lives of the people in those countries and building an immense hatred against the United States. It's killing young Americans who go over there. Uh, I, see, I see no benefit from any of those wars and wouldn't want anyone to, to go fight in them. As you thoroughly talked about the United States' involvement, what is your opinion of Canada's involvement in the modern wars? Canada's involvement as, uh, as an affiliate of the United States, supposedly through, well, I'm thinking of Afghanistan now. Fortunately, we weren't stupid enough to get involved in the Iraqi war, at least not by sending soldiers. But we're in up to our necks in Afghanistan, and uh, <laughs> uh, I think it is wrong to be there. Uh, we should not be assisting the U.S. in their adventure in Afghanistan, and it's going to be a disastrous adventure in Afghanistan. Um, someone famous whose name I have forgotten once said, those who do not know their history are condemned to repeat it. The British have invaded Afghanistan four times, if you count this time as a British invasion, because they're part of the NATO faces, forces also. The British have gotten their asses kicked in Afghanistan four times. One time when they invaded Afghanistan, they went in with an army that probably had, including camp followers and, and mercenaries, a quarter of a million people, and they sent back one medical officer came riding back out of Afghanistan to the Red Fort at Lahore to say, I am all that is left of the army of the Indus. No one has succeeded in invading Afghanistan. The Russians got their butts kicked in Afghanistan. Alexander the Great only managed to get through there by marrying into the, the tribal uh, uh, structure. Uh, the Afghans simply do not like foreigners marching through their land and particularly do not like foreigners telling them what to do. It's not going to succeed. Uh, it's an unjust war. Um, and it's going to be a very unsuccessful war, but it's still killing Afghans and Canadians and Americans and British and Pakistanis and doing what wars do, kill people. What were the long-term decisions of deserting to Canada? Long-term decisions were, uh, it probably kept me from getting a university degree, which I kind of regret. Um, in hindsight, I probably would have had some more interesting career choices if I'd had a university degree. Um, it's, but um, 
one of the long-term uh, choices has been that I am alive, happy, and healthy, and in Canada, so I can't regret it too much. The Canadian government now routinely returns deserters to the U.S. to face trial. What do you think of that? Wrong. <laughs> That's wrong. Um, the Canadian government, when I came to Canada, felt that it really wasn't that my past history was no business of theirs as long as I hadn't committed any crimes. And uh, deserting from the U.S. Army was not on their list of crimes. So um, they didn't ask back then. In fact, they were fairly careful not to ask. Uh, I don't think that Canada should be enforcing any kind of U.S. laws about desertion. And the few U.S. Army deserters that I've talked to, the two, who both had experience in Iraq, had extremely good reasons for leaving the United States. Both of them had served tours of duty in Iraq. They had experienced that war, and they had no intention of experiencing any more of it for very good causes. The idea for this interview came from reading a short story about a person who decided to go to Canada, but changed his mind at the last minute. The last lines in this story are, I survived, but it's not a happy ending. I was a coward. I went to war. Would you agree with this person? I would, and I feel pretty much the same way about it, and uh, I would hope that if this story was patterned on a real person, uh, he would think again about it, and before serving another tour of duty on some U.S. war somewhere on the other side of the world, would consider coming to Canada or almost any other country rather than continuing in the U.S. military. What are your feelings towards people who didn't decide to leave? Um, I, uh, I have to say first that I am not angry at them any more than I am angry, for instance, at Canadians who chose to serve in the Canadian forces in Afghanistan. Um, I think they have been misled uh, to lead them into to lead men into war, to lead people into war is to mislead them in any case, but I think they've been misled about the reasons for the war and uh, the reasons for their going over there. I'm sure they go over there believing that they are doing something good for their country. I hope so anyway or maybe they go over there because they simply have very few choices in their life. But in any case, I really don't hold them responsible for that. I hold uh, the, uh, the governments who are sending them over there responsible for that. Uh, I hope that they won't be damaged, but I do think that war damages people. I don't think you can go through the experience of war uh, and come out of it scot-free without any scars. Uh, and I would, uh, I would hope they come out of it with as few scars as possible. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, if I had to sum up, um, I think that uh, I made the right choices. I'm happy to be where I am now. And I hope any other Canadians or Americans who are offered a choice of going off to war somewhere like Afghanistan or Iraq, um, turn down that choice and stay here and find a life, uh, find a more peaceful path. Well, thank you, and hopefully people will learn from your experiences. 